still in the atmosphere of worship this today, we're going to spend some time to pray. You know, I want to encourage you, if you're sitting down, maybe you're lying down on your bed, I want to get up and participate in this time of prayer. This is the first Sunday in the month of May. I want to lift up your hands towards heaven and let's go ahead and thank him. Listen to me, because of the current pandemic, several people have died. You are alive, you are strong, you are healthy, your spouse is alive, your folks are alive. Nobody has died, you are not in the mortuary today. Let's go ahead and thank him. The Bible says, it's because of the message of God that we sons of Jacob are not consumed. Let's go ahead and bless him. The Bible says, for his good and his mercies endure it forevermore. Thank him for your children. Thank him for your spouse. Thank him for your marriage. Thank him for your country. Thank him for your health. Go ahead and thank him. Go ahead and thank him. Go ahead and thank him. Go ahead and give him praise. Go ahead and honor him. Oh, Lord, we praise your holy name. Lord, we bless your holy name because you are good, because you are faithful. Even when we are not faithful, you are faithful. Even when we are not our best, you are at your best for us. Father, thank you for the love that we can comprehend. Thank you for the reckless love that keeps pursuing us. We give you praise and glory, oh God. We thank you for health. We thank you for joy. We thank you for peace. We thank you for family. We thank you for life. We thank you for this country, Nigeria. Well, thank you for Lagos State. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you because we're entering into a new week. Oh, Lord, and there will be the, 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 the country will be opened up. We give you praise for this, oh God. Well, thank you because you are answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. At this time, I'm going to tell you, we're going to honor the Lord with our giving. We're going to honor the Lord with our giving. And someone says, why do Christians give? And I understand if you feel that way, that, oh, why do Christians give? Let me explain to you. The first time giving was mentioned, the first time worship was mentioned in the Bible. You know what happened at that time? The Bible says that Abraham took his son Isaac and said, I'm going to worship God. That means the concept of worship means we have something to give. We have something to sacrifice. So worship as part of our work worship or given rather given is part of our worship as we give today know that you are honoring God with your money maybe you want to give your tithe maybe you want to sow a special seed maybe you want to help with our COVID-19 project all of you know that we're feeding thousands of people we are helping several families out in this season maybe you want to help with that project and maybe you just want to give your worship offering what's the worship offering well, every time I worship the Lord, either I worship in a physical church or I worship on online, I'm able to give something of mine and say, Lord, I, I worship you. I honor you. I praise your holy name. That's worship. If you want to do that, I want to take some moments. If you want to get out your phones, some I need to copy out the account numbers. And let me say something quickly to you. All of you that are watching and you're from out of Nigeria, you can go to our website and you can use either your credit or your debit card to do a giving. But if you're giving here within the country, you can also go to the website or you can go to your the account details on the screen and make a transfer. And let me tell you something. We're going to pray right now. And let me tell you something. As we pray, remember, you are worshiping God with your money. You're worshiping God with your offering. And the Bible says this. It says, honor the Lord with your substance. It says, so shall your band be full. It's a honor thing. Lord, we worship you. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for my friends. They're bringing their tithe. They're bringing their offering. Some of them are supporting our initiative to help people that are needy at this time. I pray that you breathe upon their tithe and offerings. You breathe upon their giving. And bless it in the name of Jesus Christ. During this season, we've had you do testimonies of promotion. Testimonies of preservation. I pray for everyone that is giving right now. Please bless them. Let them see the miracles of God. And I pray for those that may be going through a loss. Maybe lost a job. Maybe have no money at all. You know where they are. And I'm praying that, Lord, in the mercy of God, that you please reach out to them and give them a miracle, oh God. We give you praise and glory for this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And listen to me. You can take a moment. The account will be on the screen. And not just on the screen. They'll be popping up different times all through this, you know, through this ministration. And afterwards, you can take a moment and go ahead and give. And then if you want to give later, you can take a picture of, of that and put it on your phone and you can go ahead and give. And as you give, one of the things I want to thank God for is this. You know, the other day, a, a newspaper company called me and say, 
what you're doing with the, with, 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 with the poor. It's amazing. It's international newspaper. And I said, well, it's not what I'm doing because I'm not that wealthy. It's what we're able to do as a church, to feed the poor, to help the homeless, and to just be a blessing to people that are around us. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today, hallelujah, I'm going to share with you something very powerful. And just in case you're joining us for the first time, you know, my name is Bolaji and I'm the pastor at Harvesters. And um, if you're here for the first time, if you are commenting, maybe you're watching in the social media space or watching on YouTube, just type there and say, hey, I'm the first time in this space. We just want to know you and welcome you. You can even take one more step and go to our website or the number on the screen and click on the first timer. We will just want to connect with you. I personally get to pray for the first time every week. And I would love to get your details and pray for you. And if this is your church, this is Harvesters, but maybe you don't know anybody, you just come and even read this time, nobody has contacted you. One of the things I want to ask you to do is, if someone says, I've been attending for some time, I've been watching for some time, what you can do is to go and sign up for the membership class. The membership class is taking place this Sunday. Every Sunday, our membership class, it's about a 90 minutes, it's online. And in that online Myself and our other pastors get to know you personally through the use of Zoom and social media. And also, you get to know other church members and you get to know how the church can serve you. Do you know during this time in our church, we literally must have called close to 8,000 people on the floor phone and say, hey, how are you doing? And we also want to be able to call you. We also want to be able to call you. And if you're a church member, you want to do something, you want to go to our website, update your information so that you can get a call from us. The other thing also is this. Um, we're asking that everybody belongs to an online group. What's an online group? We believe that if you meet in groups, nobody can feel depressed because someone will check on you. If you want to, if you're a married man, a married woman, maybe you're a single person and you want to really know Jesus Christ some more, you want people that can just check on you in case you feel down, people that can challenge you to pray, join an online group today. The details are on the screen as you do that. Today, I'm talking to you about something very powerful and profound, how to be unshakable in crisis. How to be unshakable in crisis. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. This is so good today. Matthew chapter 11 in verse 2. We're going to read a story of a man called John. If you know the Bible very well, there is a man in the Bible called John. John the, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. But, you know, towards the end of his ministry, he got arrested for preaching, the, for preaching his own gospel and when he got arrested, this is what happened. The Bible says that um, Jesus heard about it and kept on preaching. Then all of a sudden, John sent his servant to Jesus and says, Jesus, um, are you really Jesus or we should look for someone else? The background to this story is this. John was the one that God told that when the Messiah comes, when he's coming out of the river, that the Spirit of God will come upon him and stay upon him. And John saw that happen to Jesus and said, my God, this is Jesus Christ. He, he knew who Jesus was. But guess what? When John went through tough times, he began to forget his revelation. He began to forget who Jesus was. He even forgot who he was. All of a sudden, the crisis of life had beaten John so hard that John had forgotten Every single thing about himself. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, And when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent 12 disciples. And he said, Are that he that should come, or should we look for another? It, it's confusing because this is John that says, This is Jesus. But let me say something to you. There's something about hard times that makes you begin to doubt what you know. He begins to doubt who you believe. He begins to doubt the call of God and the purpose of God on your life. There's something about crisis. Crisis can make you better or crisis can make you bitter. Crisis can lead to your doom or crisis can lead to your boom. Crisis can lead to your death or crisis can lead to your innovation. All of a sudden... John was asking questions to answers that he gave already. And I'm saying so to you because when people are in crisis, they begin to doubt themselves. 
They begin to doubt their abilities. They begin to say, is this marriage worth it because the marriage is in crisis? They say, did I marry the right man? I thought I married a great man. This guy looks like an animal. I understand because it's in crisis. There are people that in Korea that are very smart and they get a letter to lay them off or to cut down their salary or they're anticipating some kind of difficulty and they wonder, my God, my life is finished. But they will never think that way if there was no crisis. There are people, there are people that will go to some challenges in their finances. People go to some challenges, maybe because they're single and they can't get married. And they're wondering, he says something wrong with me. How come I'm how come I'm 38? I'm not married right now. And because there's crisis, because crisis can make you bitter, crisis can make you better. Also, crisis can draw you close to God, or crisis can draw you far away from God. But the question I want to ask is this. When I go through crisis, how do I become unshakable? You know why? Because the Bible says, they that believe in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion. That shall never be moved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, they that believe in God. They that put their trust in God. They shall be like Mount Zion. That shall never be moved. How do you become a person that is not like John? Look at what John says. Go and ask Jesus if he's the person. Then Jesus, Jesus answered John. In verse 4, Jesus answered and said, go and show John these things, which you do, which you do here and see, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. You know, just reading this alone ministers to me. You know, you know what, I, what, what that means? In your, in, in your, in your downtime, maybe you have to stop the analysis. Maybe you ask, have to stop the asking too many questions. Maybe you have to stop listening to media. And what do you have to remember? Remember what God has done in your life. Remember when you were in secondary school, how he saved you. Remember doing the NYC, how you preserved you. Remember when your friends had no job, how God came through for you. Remember when you were sick and I was almost dying and oh God came through for you. Remember when it was difficult to have a baby, how God came through for you. Remember when you thought you would never get married and now that you're married. Remember when you thought you would never have a job and now you have a job. Remember when you said, if I buy my best car, my first car, it will be the biggest thing. Because sometimes... Human memory is very short and fickle. John had forgotten who Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ is not telling him, don't you know what the Bible says about me? This is what the scripture says. What did Jesus Christ say? Just one thing. He said, go and tell John. The blind see miracles. The deaf hear testimonies. Will you go back after today and write five things that has taken place since when you were 18 and see what the Lord has done? Many of you need to learn how to keep what I call what a gratitude journal. A gratitude journal is a book that is devoted to recording how much God has done in your life. You know why? The devil has a way of pointing you to what is not done, which is one, two, or three. But the other 97 that is done, he has a way of taking your attention away from it. And because you focus on the undone, you become unhappy and depressed. Meanwhile, in reality, you have total victory. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Glory to God. So today we're talking, about, we're talking about how to be unbeatable, how to be unshakable in crisis. And, you know, l- let, me, let me read something to you in that same chapter. The Bible says in verse 7, after Jesus Christ said, look at the testimonies. And as they departed to show that John was wrong, the Bible says, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, went ye, What went ye out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaking with wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in the king's house. But what went ye out to see? A prophet, he said, Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet is John. As a matter of fact, the next verse says, Out of the women born, there's nobody that is up to John. Do you imagine the anointing, the capacity, what God taught about John? But when John, God says, hey, think of Elijah, think of Moses, think of all the prophets. There's nobody that is in the category of John. Can you believe that? And this was John that's forgotten who he was because he went to crisis. You know, once you go to crisis, be careful that you forget who you are. That you forget who your God is. You forget who you are in Christ and what your God can do. And that's why today, 
as I talk about how to be unshakable in crisis, I want to focus on one thing. And this is what I'm going to focus on this month. And this month, I'm going to talk about who you really are. Because you can forget who you are. And let me tell you something. One of the things the devil loves to do is to steal identity. Satan wants to steal identity to confuse people. How did he do that? He went to meet Adam and Eve and said, hey, do you want to be like God? They were already like God. They were already like God. He said, do you want to be like God? And in them trying to be what they were, they became what they were not. And Satan loves to steal identity. But the question is this, why is my identity powerful? That's the first question. Why is my identity powerful? Who am I in the first place? What is the power of an identity? I came, ac- I came across a story recently. And um, there was a man that was fitting, that, 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 that was found rather, beaten behind the bar somewhere, I think in California or Atlanta, I can't remember where exactly. And this man, he was sick, beaten. They took him to the hospital, recovered him. And because of the beating, he had lost his memory. So when he woke up out of coma, they said, who are you? He couldn't remember. And the FBI, police, everybody ran fingerprints on him. And they could not find his history in the whole of America. And you know what? Um, Dr. Phil TV show picked him up, tried to find out who he was. They couldn't find him. Several big TV show people picked him up, trying to locate him. They could not locate him. And because he didn't know who he was, there was nothing he could dream to be. That's the power of identity. If you don't know who you are, what are you going to become? This man became a man that had no beginning or ending, no history. He didn't know if he had a wife, he had a child, he had people. He knew nothing about himself. Listen to me. Mm. How will I say this to you? Because this is very powerful. Somebody say hallelujah. If you don't know who you are, it won't matter who you are. If you don't know what you have, it won't matter what you have. If you don't know who you are, it won't matter who you are. If you don't know what you have, it won't matter what you have. So the question is, who am I? What do I have? You know, this power of an identity. Here, I, I, have, I, ha- I have one of our church leaders here. He's a, he's a police. There's a police ID. And, you know, as I look at this police ID here, maybe he walks to you in mufti. You know, just the power of identity. How he walks, he says, hey, what's your name? And you be like, are you an idiot? Why should I tell you my name? But the moment he says, excuse me, what is your name? You know why? Because your identity shows who you are. Praise God. Your identity shows what you carry. Praise God. Your identity shows the authority behind you. Praise God. So when we talk about what is your identity or why your identity is important, it's very powerful. Because when you go through the storms of life, you need to understand, this is who I am. This, the capability that is in my spirit, this, the authority that is behind me. So why is identity important? Number one, because identity tells your origin. So when he shows this identity card, he shows that he's from the police force. What happens? The way you approach him changes because he shows who he is. Your identity tells your origin. Many of you keep saying that, you know, I, I, I'm a stubborn, ekiti man. Listen to me. If you got born again, your origin changed. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you got born again, your origin changed. Ha, what does the Bible say? He says, if any man be in Christ, he, he's a new creature. Hey, hey, hey. The one that is a stubborn, ekiti man died. This is a brand new man from Christ. Praise God. Because your identity reveals your origin. The second thing is this. Your identity reveals your capability. What does capability mean? When it shows that he's a policeman, there is capacity that comes with that. Hallelujah. As a child of God, when you hear the facts that you are a child of God, there's responsibility. The responsibility is such that you have the capacity to perform. Hallelujah. I have the capacity to perform. The third thing your identity does is this. Your identity defines your access. Your identity defines your access. It defines your access. It defines your authority. It defines you. So, some places you can enter because you have access. That's your, that's your identity. See, because I know who I am, there are places I can enter. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy in time of need. That request is not to everybody. That request is to people that already have access through the finished work of Christ. He said, let us come boldly to
to the throne of grace. Not everybody can come boldly to the throne of grace. Listen, some Christians are always telling people, pray for me. I need prayer. They're going to prayer mantis and looking for prayer warriors and they know them distributing prayer. That's not who a Christian is. A Christian is not the one that is looking for prayer. A Christian is the one that people are coming to prayer. Why? As a child of God, he has access into the into what? Into the throne of grace. He can obtain mercy. Hallelujah. He can obtain mercy on behalf of his family. Mercy on behalf of his children. Mercy on behalf of his nation. The Bible says the prayer of a righteous man, it makes tremendous power available. When the child of God prays, power is released. Praise God. That's why your identity is important. If you don't know what you have, it wouldn't matter what you have. The consciousness of who you are determines your response to life. You know, in this period, I was talking to one of our leaders that, you know, leads some of the departments at the airport. And I said, I heard that all flights are shut down. He said, um, well, not all flights, but about 90%. I said, the flight that coming in, where do they come from? He said, some nationals are allowed to fly to come and pick their citizen in the country. My God. Is that not amazing? You know, because there's all this talk about, oh my God, is it the end? Is it the end? Is it the end? Listen to me. If the world is going to collapse before it gets there, our embassy will call for a recall. Praise God. That recall is called the rapture. We are I'm not afraid about the world collapsing because we are citizens. We are come, we belong to a commonwealth of Zion. We are citizens of an eternal kingdom. And our kingdom is responsible for us. If a physical kingdom will get their citizens out of trouble before it escalates, talk less about the kingdom of love where God is the king. Listen, he will have to shake us out before it gets worse. And that's why I want to tell you, I believe that as long as I'm here, the Antichrist has to stay back. Because the Bible says, he that will let will let until it's taken out of the way. That's the power of my identity. So the second question is this. What is my identity? Because when I say identity, don't say, oh, yeah, yeah. What's your identity? I'm a doctor. That's what I'm talking about. Don't say, what's your, what's your identity? You say, I'm a, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pharmacist. That's what I'm talking about. So say, what's your identity? I'm a mother. Th- see, that's wonderful. But that's a natural identity. Hey, but there's what God calls you. There's how God sees you. There's what God says about you. Will you please turn into a very popular scripture? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Let's see your identity here. Oh, glory to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, glory. I'm excited. I hope you are. Oh, glory to God. Second Corinthians chapter 5. What is my identity? The first thing you must know is this. You are a spirit. So I say, am I a spirit? Of course. Because the Bible says in the book of James that the spirit without the, that death is the spirit without the body. That's what the Bible calls death. That's physical death. When the spirit is separated from the body, that's what the Bible calls death. So I'm a spirit. Even when my body is in the casket, and it's dying there, my spirit is functioning perfectly somewhere else. So, listen to me. I'm not this body that you see. This body is a covering for me. Because you need to see yourself the way God sees you. You need to see yourself the way God sees you. So, how does God see you? So, when we talk about who you really are, I'm not talking about you from the outside. Some people be like, oh my God, I'm a slave king, I'm a slave queen, oh my God. You know, I understand all the things you are, you are. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I have a British passport, I have a, you know, Jamaican passport. I thank God for your life, but all those things is here. How does God see you? You know, God does not see you as American and a Jamaican and a Britons. He doesn't see you that way. He sees the world in two ways. God's children and God's creature. Who are God's children? God's children are people that have come into a vital relationship with him and have experienced the rebirth. Who are God's creature? He created them, but they're not linked to him. They are dead in their sin. They're far from God. Maybe you're watching today, you're far from God. It's time to come back. All those things that is happening, does it not reflect to you that you need God in your life? 
all this thing that is happening, does it not tell you that you need Jesus in your life? And listen to me, someone says, how do I know I need Jesus in my life? If you feel that punch in your heart, when I spoke about needing Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit touching your heart, saying you have to give your life to Christ. Someone says, how do you know that? Because Satan will never punch your heart to give your life to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit nudging you and tapping you on that bed and tapping you on that, uh, as you watch that TV set, and tapping you on that phone and say, surrender your heart to Christ. And what you have to do is simple. Get out your phone. Stop for a moment. Send a text and say, I want to give my life to Christ right now. To the number of the screen. But who am I in Christ? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Who am I? Hey, 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 hey. Hallelujah. This is exciting. How, how does God see me? See, you guys see me as a pastor. You, some of you that don't know me see me as a religious person. But my mother sees me as a son. Because they are seeing the same thing but from different dimensions. But the most important way you can be seen is how God sees you. Why? He's God that makes you, what he sees about you is the perfect summation of who you are. How does God see you? 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17. Wow. What does the Bible say? King James says it this way. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, uh uh-huh. See, he didn't say this is for everybody. He says, If a man makes a decision and says, I'm tired of living my own way. I want to come into Christ and receive what Christ has done. He says, if any man be in Christ. What's the next thing? The Bible says, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. But all all things have become new. What does that mean? Physically, nothing changes. But in the spirit, the Bible says a brand new person. Let's talk about this way. What does it mean when the Bible says, if any man be in Christ? Let let me show you an example. Let me show you an example. For the sake of illustration, this red drink is Christ. This water is normal. It says, if this man comes into Christ. The powerful thing is this. This is a powerful thing. When this man comes into Christ, can you separate the man and Christ? No. No. You know what? The water has mixed with the drink. The drink has mixed with the water. Now they can't be separated. So, what do you call this man? He's no longer a normal man because part of him is God. Part of him is man. When you say you want to separate him, how can you separate him? He can't be separated. That is what it means to be in Christ. How oh, glory to God. Let me explain this in a deeper way. Let me explain this in a deeper way to you. He says, if any man be in Christ, he he is a new creature. What does that mean? When I come into Christ, my natural life ceases to exist. A new life has come into existence. Hallelujah. What does that mean? What it means that number one, I am in Christ and Christ is in me. What does that mean? He says, I am in union with Christ. Praise God. I am what? In union with Christ. Hey, what that means is this. When God sees me, he can't separate me from Jesus Christ. When I pray, he's like Jesus praying because it's all mixed together right now. That's why I pray in the name of Jesus. So when I pray in the name of Jesus, it's like Jesus Christ praying. That's how God sees me. How does God see you? God sees you the way he sees Christ. You have his righteousness. You have his Holy Spirit. You have his position. That's what the Bible says. When Jesus rose from the dead, he says we rose up with him. When he sat down in heaven, he said we sat down with him. Hallelujah. We are seated and joined with Christ. Say amen, somebody. Oh, glory to God. I'm in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. What does that mean? The first thing that means is this. God is pleased with me. Because some of you think that God is mad at you. You say, God is angry. Listen, if you don't want God to be mad at you, come into Christ. You know why? Once you are mingled with Christ, God cannot be angry at you. When you're in Christ, I I please God because Christ pleases God. That's the first thing. I I please God because Christ pleases God. The second thing is this. I'm not under a curse. Some people always say things like they are generational curses. They say, oh, the problem you have, hmm, why why are you not married? Oh, wow. 
what's your village? You say, Koto Pele. say, oh, we have to go there because there's a generational cost in your grandfather's house. And they say, the reason why you don't have a job is because, oh, where, where are you from? He said, I'm from Bruno. There's a cost in that place. He said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Oyo. There's a cost in that place. Where are you from? I'm from Jamaica. Oh, my God. They do a lot of juju and voodoo there. That's a cost in that place. But in Christ, there is no cost. You know why? If I'm mixed with Christ, like God drink mixed with water, if for me to be cost, Christ has to be cost. For me to be cursed, Christ has to be cursed. If Christ cannot be cursed, then I cannot be cursed. Listen to me. The moment the water and the drink mix, that means something. The features are the same. I have the same DNA like God. I have the same DNA like God. I have the same DNA like Christ. That's what it means when it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creature. Oh, glory to God. I have God's DNA. The second thing is this. So, I can't be cursed. I'm not the one that needs deliverance. Hallelujah. Why? The moment I stepped into Christ, I was delivered. Which demon can follow me into Christ? Where is he from? Where are they? Who is their father? Where did they come from? I'm coming to Christ. Hallelujah. Hey, what that means is this. Once the drink and the water merge, the, the, the particles merge, the same thing. That means what Christ can do, I can do. What I can do, Christ can do. Glory to God. You know why I'm saying this to you today? Because you need to know how God sees you. Because how you see yourself is how you behave. Some of you, they will say, oh, you know, there's witches and wizards. And you start hiding and start hiding. Hide? I'm in Christ. If a witch has to touch me, has to go through Christ. What cannot happen to Christ cannot happen, happen to me. Listen to me. They say, everybody's dying. Everybody's getting sick. What cannot happen to Christ cannot happen to me because I'm in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? To be in Christ means I'm in Christ, but Christ is also in me. What does it mean when you say Christ is also in me? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I said this a while ago, but I don't know if you remember this. Ah, eh, many of you come from villages where there are shrines. When you go maybe back for holiday, no matter your, how much you're playing around, you never play around a shrine because a shrine is a sacred place. Question is this, what makes a shrine a shrine? You know, they say it's a Madiora shrine. They say it's a Bracadabra shrine. They say it's a Shanghai shrine in Brazil. They say it's a, it's a moon shrine in, 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 in Japan. Whatever shrine it is, nobody plays with a shrine because it's sacred. That's where their God stays. That's where the idol God stays. And people respect the shrine. They even take food to the shrine. They go to the shrine and even worship. They go to the shrine and even worship. <laughs> but guess what? What makes a shrine a shrine is that their idols live in the shrine. But when Christ lives in me, what does that mean? That God lives inside me. Hey, if God lives on the inside of me, what does that make me? I'm a mobile shrine. Praise God. I, I'm a mobile shrine, praise God. I'm a mo hey, but careful how you talk about me. I'm a shrine, praise God. If you come against me, you'll be punished. Hallelujah. I, I'm a mobile shrine. That's why the Bible says, No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned in judgment. See what it says. He says, They shall lay hands upon the sick. They don't contact the sickness, the sick contacts their health because they are a mobile shrine. Everywhere they go, they go with the power of God. Everywhere they go, they go with the wisdom of God. What does it mean when he say Christ is in me? When he say Christ, that if any man be in Christ, that means I have access. Access to resources beyond myself. When there's a business decision to make, when there's um, a key career decision to make, when there's an investment decision to make, and it seems as if I don't know what to do in the natural. I remind myself that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. That means I have resource beyond my natural resources. There is resource beyond my natural resources. It's like having two ATM cards. You use the first ATM card, there's no money there. You bring out the second one. And this second ATM card is unlimited. Praise God. Hey, the natural wisdom could have dried up. Naturally, you may not know what to do. But now that you are in Christ, 
All you have to do is to dig on the inside. No wonder Paul says it this way. He said, Christ in me is the hope of glory. He said, Christ in me, he's the hope of glory. Hey, he says, I have unlimited access. It's like internet. When you have unlimited bundle, you, you, you browse and browse and browse and browse. He doesn't finish. Christ's riches are inexhaustible. It's the inexhaustible riches in Christ. We can dig into it. We can step into it. That's why a child of God cannot be stuck. That's why a child of God cannot be limited. Because when they think they've seen the end of you, then Christ will take over. Hallelujah. I say Christ will take over. That's why the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You go through life, this is a very difficult situation. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you lost some money. And one voice tells you on the inside, it's finished. You say, you think I'm finished because I lost my job? You think I'm finished because I have marital problems? You think I'm finished because the doctor said somewhere in the book that I can't have a child? You think that's my end? See, the reason why you think that way is that you don't know me. You think that I'm a normal human being. That all that is to me is hands, ears, you know, legs, and a degree, and a job. But there's more to me than that. So I said, really? What is there more to you? The Bible says this. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Praise God. You know what that means? Whatever you're going through, brother. I, I don't know where you're listening from. Sister, I don't know where you're listening from. Whatever you're going through, maybe it's a business, you can get the deal. Maybe it's a capital, you can raise the money. Maybe it's an addiction, you can break. Maybe the doctor said you can, you can, you cannot have a child. Maybe it's COVID-19 you're dealing with. And maybe you cannot recover. Whatever you're hearing me for, the Bible says this. He said, greater. He's he dies in you, that he dies in the world. That means the power to overcome the world and his challenge and his opposition is right down the inside of you. If it's a sickness, your faith can overcome it. If it's a, if it's a financial challenge, your faith can overcome it. If it's a marital challenge, you can overcome it. So says, How? Because greater, there's someone in me that is bigger than the whole world. He's bigger, he's brighter, he's the biggest of the biggest, he's the largest of the largest. Hallelujah. The psalmist says it this way. He's he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the lift up your everlasting doors. He said, let the king of glory come in. Who is the king of glory? He said, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord of strong and mighty in battle, for he is the king of glory. Go ahead and say amen. He is the king of glory. Listen, don't mess with me. Great eye, is he? Have a look small. Spent book of us will say, I'm 1,000 times bigger on the inside than on the outside. I'm going to look small. I'm going to look tiny. I'm going to look as if I have nobody. People always say, you don't have no Godfather. That's why I couldn't get the job. If you have no Godfather, remember you have God the Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. Human beings are Godfather, they die. But God the Father never died. The Bible calls him the ancient of days. The one that began before time existed. Hallelujah. Remember. I'm telling you something. Don't settle for less. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on this year yet. Don't give up on your visions. Don't give up on your focus. Listen to me. Let faith well up in you. When you face impossible things, go back to the word. Listen, he's only the, this is the manual. This is the manual that comes with your life. If you have a problem with your iPhone, you go to the manual. Now you have a problem with your life. Stop listening to rubbish. You go back to the book. First John, he said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You tell yourself, he said, greater is he that is in me. They say, you can't raise the capital. All you need is 2.5 billion. You say greater. He's he that is in me than he that is in the world. They say your mind is over. You say greater. He's he that is in me than he that is in the world. They say, madam, the fiber is too big. The womb is destroyed. Palopian tube is blocked. Woman, you will hold your womb like this. You will say greater. He's he that is in me than he that is in the world. When you take that business document, you merge around the business documents. You lift them up towards heaven. This is the deal. They want to take you with their power. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Stand up and let's pray. Anywhere you are, on your bed at home in the kitchen, pause for a moment, let's pray. Lift up your hands towards heaven and begin to declare that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world.
I have a word of a coming faith. I have first class faith. I'm victorious. Hallelujah. I'm victorious. Hallelujah. I'm victorious. Everything I do, I'm victorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not limited by physical options. I have supernatural options. Hallelujah. The greater one is on the inside of me. The greater one is on the inside of me. My faith overcomes every obstacle. Praise God. Hallelujah. I see myself the way God sees me. I am in Christ, a brand new creation with supernatural options. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey. And Father, we well, thank you. And today, I'm praying for people that are going through tough times and it seems as if their faith is drowned and they've forgotten what they are. I'm praying the revelation of the word will dawn in their spirits. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, let hope and faith be stirred up. Let the greater one rise on the inside of you. That business challenge is cancelled. That loan, that, that money that has been owed to you is paid in Jesus' name. That job, you've gotten a better job right now. That promotion has come through for you in the name of Jesus Christ. And listen to me, if you're sick in your body, even if whatever it is, it could be the raging coronavirus, it could be some kind of sickness, like you can't get pregnant. Our God has done it severally, and it will do it just now. I command every infirmity to go. I command it to be healed from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. I rebuke the spirit of infirmity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be gone in Jesus' name. I command the ears to be healed. I command the deafness, that deafness to go in Jesus' name. That hearing for them to cease. I command pains to leave your bodies in Jesus' name. That arthritis and the pains to feel along your ways. Move it right now. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, he make every withhold. Hallelujah. That loss you've had in your business. Receive grace for recovery. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Everything has changed right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Glory to God. And listen, let me tell you something. If I prayed for you because maybe you were sick in your body, put your hands there and say, I receive healing. And say it three times and begin to do what you could not do before. You'll find out that you are healed. As soon as you find out you are healed, send me a message. Send me an email. Send me a text message. All of you in business, something has happened to you. Wisdom will come to you today. And if you want to give your heart to Christ, you send a message. We will love to pray with you as you do that. As I conclude this session and invite the choir to come and lead us in an exciting, powerful praise in what we are in Christ Jesus, I want to say to you that um, we're going to have a healing service soon and begin to pray yourself. And also, if you've not given your offerings, if you've not given your offerings for any, any, any reason, this is the time to give your offering. We prayed about it in the, in the beginning of the service. Some of you missed it. Time to give your offering. This is on the screen. Some of you wanted to give later. It's time to give your offering. As the choir comes up, the offerings numbers will be on the screen. And Lord, I pray. See, there's such a great anointing here. There's such a great anointing here that your blessing will be upon everyone that is given today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.